Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the world of the International Fab Talks. Fab Talks is all about creating awareness, getting in the right kind of celebrities to share their life, to share their experiences, and to share all the ups and downs that they have faced, no matter what they have faced. They are here to share the willpower that they have within them to make it to the top. Join us, friends, to welcome our celebrity and guest who's here with us. She's a wonderful, multi-talented person. She's here with us and she has consented to share her time with us today. That's the great thing. Somebody agreeing to share their time with us. That is for you and for me to create awareness, to open our eyes and to follow the right path. Join us, friends, to welcome Miss Arpita Chatterjee. She's here with us, joining us all the way from Kolkata, West Bengal, India. Hello, ma'am, and welcome to the session, dear. Hello, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you, ma'am, for being so polite and humble to accept the invitation. That really means a lot to us when people are ready to share their time, to create awareness and to grow with us for the right reasons. Thank you so much. With your permission, I go ahead and share your profile and then we begin the session, dear. Please go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. Friends, as you all know, it's our duty, responsibility. You could say it's even a honor and a privilege to share the rich profiles of our celebrities and guests. And today we have with us Arpita Ma'am. Let's get to know more about her story. Let's celebrate her life here on the International Fab Talks. And you have to learn the courage, the resilience, and the willpower that Ma'am has. Now, you'll be really interested to know as to who she is. She's a wonderful musician, a counselor, a music therapist, a translator, a teacher, the managing trustee of Sangeetika Seva Trust, if I'm getting that right, she's the Assistant Governor of District 3291 of Rotary International. I'd like to add more to Ma'am's profile, dear friends. She is Mrs. Arpita Chatterjee. She has completed her BA Honours in Economics. I repeat it once again for all of you. Mrs. Arpita Chatterjee has completed a BA Honours in Economics from Miranda House, Delhi University, Sangeet Praveen from Prayag Sangeet Samiti, Allahabad, Teacher's Training Certificate from Doreta College, Calcutta University. She has also trained as a music therapist and counselor for various organizations. She has been touching the lives of several people. It could be Calcutta University, Ecology Limited, Udemy, Council India, Educational Board of Vocational Training and Research, Government of India, etc. She is not only a musician, but also a teacher, translator, as I earlier mentioned, a great counselor, a music therapist, a wonderful author who has worked in print, audiovisual, and as well as multimedia productions. Guess for how many decades? For the past four decades. And she's still going strong. That's wonderful, ma'am. She's an active Rotarian, joining the International Voluntary Organization in the year 1996 and is a nature lover as well. Imagine the immense you know, the, the immense areas and zones that man is connected with, nature lover, a teacher, a musician, a music therapist, and all of that is really wonderful. Sometimes I wonder how people could, you know, don several hats like this and, you know, be good in all of it. There are some people, for example, me, I'm good at only in certain things, but when I meet people like you, it really impresses me, like, how could you all do that? You, you appear somebody divine to me or somebody extraordinary. That's really nice, ma'am. So ma'am is a wonderful natural uh, connected to nature or a nature lover, you could say, connected with natural things. She's also a wonderful social activist. That's great. Working with several voluntary organizations. Presently, she's the managing trustee of Sangeetika Seva Trust. She has received several awards for all the notable work that she has done till date. To mention a few here is ETV Women's Award in 1995, Maitreyi, Award for Excellence in Performance in 2002, Indian Glory Award for the Best Music Teacher 2021, apart from other innumerable awards from the Rotary World, and as a human being, she is a blessing to the universe. All that I can say, she is an angel with invisible wings and a queen with an invisible crown. Hello, ma'am, and welcome to the session. Thank you so much for taking out some time for us. Now, Thank you for giving me such a wonderful introduction. I don't, I don't really think I deserve it, but thank you anyway. You're very humble. You're very humble. Thank you so much. Because see, when we shape your profile, we get to know as to what rich experience you have, how much you put out yourself for the benefit of mankind. That's really wonderful. Dear, now there'll be several of your friends, your family members, relatives, unknown people, strangers, the youngsters, everyone 
they would love to know how would you describe yourself for all of them? Who is the real Arpita Chatterjee? If you could share that and then we begin the session. You know, quite frankly, I've uh, basically been trying to find myself, you know? So I'm a very sensitive person, essentially. I've always loved singing, but uh, in my, uh, after college, I was studying economics in college and uh, I had wanted to do my master's in music because in those days, the music faculty of Delhi University used to be just across the road from Miranda House. And some of the best musicians were there. And I was a student of music already. And, um, you know, the entire experience was such that I wanted, uh, I found myself being more interested in music than in economics. So even before I graduated, I wanted to do my master's in music. But unfortunately, and it's true even today, in the world of music, it's very, very difficult to, you know, make a career. So you have to be very lucky. So my father's point was that you're such a brilliant student. Why will you give all that up and, you know, study music? So, well, anyway, I had uh, for, for some time a big discord with my father but then I started working. I actually got a job as a computer programmer. We had learned uh, binary in school, you know, we had um, modern maths in school. And I finished my school in Bombay. And uh, the school I went to, Queen Mary's, was perhaps one of the most progressive schools. And our principal was a really, really progressive English lady, Miss P.R. Shelton. And uh, she had introduced additional maths. So the binary and everything was very simple to me. And considering I was a mere graduate, I got a job where the other people who had sat for the test were, you know, PhD students and all that. So I started working directly after I graduated. And then, unfortunately, my father got transferred after about two years of working in Delhi. Just when I was, you know, kind of finding my feet in uh, computers, my father got transferred to Kolkata. And uh, as it happened in those days in Kolkata, computers were very few and far between. So then I had to look for another uh, profession. So uh, since I had already been on radio and television in Delhi, uh, media became the immediate choice. So uh, my uh, first job in Kolkata, job, well, you might say I did several things then. I was in print media. I was working for the Economic Times. They had a wonderful weekend reading uh, supplement for which I used to write. And I used to be, I, I became a radio announcer, English announcer on All India Radio in 1978. So uh, for years I did English language programs. And in fact, we had uh, Bulbul Sharkar, who was uh, one of the programming, uh, you know, she looked after Western music programs in All India Radio Kolkata. And she was the one who actually gave me a way of making money without selling my music you know so music became something of my heart I didn't have to make money from it but I pursued it and I learned from very famous performers of the Agra Gharana and I'm a classical Hindustani musician and um, yet I was making money through doing voiceovers and you know writing scripts and writing for the newspaper and then of course as it happens with most women <laughs> marriage came along and with that the obligations of family so uh, media became a very difficult profession so then I turned to classroom teaching I did my 
a teacher's training program, which you talked about, you know, the Calcutta University, I did my teacher's training certificate. And I started teaching in a school. As it happened, it was a CBSE school and CBSE insisted on doing a graded co-curricular activity for all students. So I started teaching music in school. And uh, after about, well, I, I was a nursery teacher for 15 years. And regularly, my the counselor would say, you know, what is it you're teaching in your music club? Because these people, are, you, you ought to do some kind of research on it. Because you're teaching something which is helping the students to learn. So that was when I decided that I had to do research on the developmental and therapeutic impact of Hindustani music training. So for five years, I worked at the uh, at a very famous music academy, the ITC Sangeet Research Academy. I eventually headed the academic research department and I did several projects. And I think I also owe Sister Cyril of Loretto Sialda. I owe her a lot because she gave me some students with whom I could test out all the, you know, all the music and, and um, she was really very, very helpful. And somehow I realized that through music, you could not just enable people, but there was a certain brain development aspect, you know. And then after that, I started working on my own. So through Sangeetika Seva Trust, we now go into schools and explain to teachers that um, are the various aspects of music, you know, how you can use it as a pedagogic tool in education and how you can use it for therapy. I also teach music therapy in, on Council India. So I think it basically, I've always responded to life itself, you know? And I've been very lucky. I've always had the opportunities that a lot of people I'm sure have ideas which they want to try out, but they can't. But in my case, I think um, I was favored by, I don't know, I guess, it's divine kind of, you know, it's a blessing. I've always kind of found the right thing to do at, at, at a time when, you know, I'm, a lot of people go in, into a, uh, a lot of internal turmoil. But for me, I always got the answers somehow. So I don't know, I guess I've, I'm blessed, I would say, you know, been very, very lucky. And uh, during the pandemic, I realized how important music therapy could be, you know, because we really, really, um, I started an, a monthly singing session. In fact, uh, now it's become monthly. During the pandemic, it was once a week. And uh, we used to meet on Tuesday evenings at eight o'clock and, uh, Thanks to the Rotary, I had people from all over India and from some part, different parts of the world also joining on. I still do that program, but I do that only once a month. And we just enjoy ourselves, you know. We don't have to be great musicians. We just have to love singing, that's all. And now what has happened is I really believe that over the years, I, I've kind of come to the conclusion that if you allow music to be a part of your life, you have a more happy life, I think. You know, if you just let yourself sing. A lot of people are very conscious about, you know, they say, I can't sing or um, I, I don't sing well. But it's not a matter of how well you sing. It's a matter of letting your, you know, the inner vibrations come out. So that is my latest, uh, how will I put it? You know, everybody needs to have, I have all my life, needed to have a cause, you know, something to fight for. I don't know if, if this sounds amusing, 
but uh, my aim today is to uh, reach out to people and explain to them that for uh, well-being, all you need to do is see. Try it sometime. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's really nice and very interesting to know. Now, I have a question in my mind. When did this interest begin in you, your connection with music? Was it as a child or in your year? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. My mother used to sing. So, and uh, you know, in Bengali families, there's a, in those days, there was no television, right? So what uh, we used to do was every evening, we'd spend time by singing together. So this, I think it's true even in a lot of other, why just Bengal? I mean, many parts of India, we have had vocal traditions, you know, everybody group singing or, you know, uh, bhajan singing together. No, that is that is a tradition in India, actually. So we had a lot of it in the family. Many people in my family used to sing. So music was very much a part of our lives. It's wonderful. I, That's wonderful. Yes, dear. Please continue. No, uh, you know, that that is perhaps uh, one of the reasons why I was so upset when my father said that I couldn't take it seriously because it was all part of the family. And, you know, I mean, why would he be so upset if I wanted to take it up professionally? Of course, along the way, I realized, because even today, you know, any of the performing arts are very difficult uh, uh, to establish oneself professionally. Now, of course, we have a lot of television channels and a lot, there's YouTube and, you know, but uh, to, to be able to actually become a performing musician in the true sense of the term, it really is a lot of hard work and people don't really realize that because any of the performing arts, when you see it, the performance, you know, it, it's maximum three hours and then it's over. So people don't realize how many years of hard work went behind that, you know, that three minute performance of a song, say on Spotify. I mean, the person who's singing has actually been practicing for years and years and years, you know? So, yes, uh, even today, any of the performing arts is difficult to make a profession out of. But if you're very fond of it, I guess eventually you, you know, and if the gods are willing, then eventually you do, you know, you do make it your profession. I think that's more or less what it was for me because I never gave up. I couldn't, you know. That's very interesting to know, ma'am. That's really interesting. Now, ma'am, any incident about your childhood, if you could share that with us, any memorable incident? Were you the naughty one, calm or the quiet child uh, of the family? Actually, I used to be, you know, in Bengali, uh, the word is, uh, the word for neighborhood is para. So uh, in the good old days, we came back from school and then uh, in the late afternoon, we would go out playing and we'd play in the streets only. I mean, there were not that many cars and, you know, th th there were, if there were playgrounds, we'd also go there. There, th there was a lot more physical movement, you know. So uh, my mother would uh, invariably, you know, I'd, land up in a neighbor's house and then chat the parents. I was a very, very outward kind of extrovert kind of person. And um, my mother would call me Parar Gazette. That means I'd, I'd have the latest of uh, information about what's happening in every house, you know, with, uh, with, uh, and I used to have lots and lots of friends. The entire neighborhood was a friend of mine kind of thing. So, yes, I have, you know, uh, fallen on roofs, you know, if we, we were playing on the terrace and I've fallen and I've hurt my knee and not bothered to let, tell my mother, you know, I would tell the uh, lady of the house that, you know, all I need is a little bit of Dettol and you give me some tincture benzene, 
and I'll be fine. And uh, so half the time, my mother wouldn't even know that I had fallen on the terrace and been bleeding on the knees. Next morning, when I was bathing and wearing my school uniform and leaving, then she'd say, what were you, you know, what are your knees looking like that for? So, yes, I've, I've been, a, I was a pretty naughty girl, kind of. But I think I, it, it all goes uh, to having a high level of energy. You know, and uh, in my childhood, I never used to like books, actually. I got to love books much, much later in life. I, uh, my brother was a very good student. He always came first in class. And I grew up with the impression that I wasn't very good at all. Though actually I was. I mean, I did pretty well. But you know how it is when you have only one brother and they're always coming first in class and coming home with goodness knows how many prize books, you know, <laughs> you grow up feeling that you're somewhat inferior. But then I guess you grow out of that and you realize that uh, you also can make something out of your life. Yes, dear. that's really nice, ma'am, for sharing. Thank you so much. You've taken us down memory lane. You've explained mm -hmm. how you hurt your bruised your knee and then you, you know, concealed that from your mom. And, you know, you made me remember my childhood too. You know, I was just imagining myself doing all of that as well. That's really interesting. Now, dear ma'am, did you ever get lost in your childhood anywhere? Like you were in some unknown place and then people had to search for you, something like that too? No, not really, no. No, actually, uh, quite frankly, um, I think I never really went to places that I didn't know, you know, right. I mean, That's getting really lost nice. means you, you have to go into areas which you, where you don't really know. So when I was in class seven, my father got transferred to Bombay. So for a while in Bombay, I didn't know any of the roads. Then, you know, school, I was still in school. So going and coming back from school, I started learning the roads then of course as luck would have it just when I got to know Bombay my father got transferred to Delhi so I finished I did my uh, college in Delhi because my father was in Delhi so again that initial you know in the beginning I didn't know the roads so or I you know I wouldn't go anywhere alone for fear that I get lost but after a while even Delhi became home so I got to know the roads and as I told you earlier that uh, after two years of working in Delhi my father got transferred to Calcutta so life has been interesting you know adjusting to new people learning languages I'm you know that's why I translate quite a bit I love languages it um, you know I translate into English but um, it keeps me alive somehow. No, and I, I don't want to forget the languages that I learned in my childhood. So that's, mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons why I still translate, actually. Yes, you're one lucky person. You had the uh, privilege of, you know, moving around different cities of India. And most of them are the metropolitan cities. Yes, that's Absolutely. Really Yes. Now, may I know what dad was into? Was he a government? Uh... No, no, no. He was in the private sector. He worked in a multinational company. That's really nice to know. Yes, dear. that's how I get to know that, you know, you have been to Delhi, you've been to Calcutta, you've been to Mumbai and all of that. That's really nice, ma'am. And I'd now like to ask you about your early teenage and your youth stage. How was that? Was it difficult adjusting to the new people when you met them? And you might have, you know, had your own reservations as a young girl or challenges, you could say. What type of challenges you faced as a young girl during those days? You know, it's, it's very interesting what you say. Um, I, uh, as I said, I, when I was in class seven, my father got transferred to Bombay. And uh, so I was faced with a situation where I had uh, English as my first language and Bengali as my second language, all through primary school and up to class seven. And then suddenly I had to have Hindi as my second language. 
And Bengali was obviously, I mean, you know, what would they do with Bengali? So I had to learn either Marathi or Gujarati. And in Bombay in those days, there were four languages. So I had to also learn either French or Sanskrit. As luck would have it, I learned French and I used to sit at the back of the Gujarati class. So I still can read Gujarati, although eventually my school took special permission and uh, in the uh, board exam, I did Bengali as my third language. So I've had languages, you know, I, I think I've, I've had a great uh, exposure to a whole lot of languages. And um, I think, you know, in a way that has also had an impact on me because you know, when you realize that there are so many cultures around you, a language is basically a culture, a stream of culture, you know. So that makes, I think, uh, uh, you know, that exposes you to a lot of very interesting ideas, interesting, for example, when we were in Bombay, we uh, used to see a lot of Marathi theater and um, of course, there was always in the sunny classical music. But uh, I think if you ask me, my school, the one that I went to in Bombay, had a great part in uh, influencing my ideas because that was the age, you know, during my teens, finishing school, I had a lot of very, very um, progressive teachers in school and um, I think uh, I remember one <laughs> one class where mm, unfortunately I uh, misbehaved you know um, and uh, eventually I gave up biology but uh, more because I well I, I used to hate uh, cutting you know you have to do a whole lot of a dissection and I didn't want to do that but what I did instead was take geography more because the geography teacher was so amazing I mean we had a wonderful geography teacher in school in Queen Mary's and Miss Clark and she too had a great influence on me and I think that's probably why it's the progressive ideas that I got in school that helped me, uh, in fact, become the person that I am. You know, if I didn't have all those very progressive teachers, I don't think I would be what I am. That's wonderful. You're giving credit to your teachers. That's really nice, man. That's great. Now, dear, you are connected to the music world. In the music world, who is your inspiration? Oh, then I have to go to Delhi. Now, how did I get into Hindustani classical music? We come from a family of Bengali musicians, you know, not classical music. My mother learned, but, it, you know, that was more to um, make her voice develop or it, it wasn't to perform classical music. It was more to sort of develop her personality. But I, when we first went to Delhi, I remember seeing a performance, attending a performance of uh, Vidushi Dipali Nag. She's wearing this amazing sari, you know, it was green with maroon border. And she was singing Nom To Malap in Rag Jajavanti. And I don't know, I was mesmerized. I said, I just had to learn that. So she was really my first inspiration uh, in classical music. And I be became her student, but then um, she herself became very busy. So later I learned from several other teachers, uh, Vidushi Aparna Chakravarti for 15 years, and then Vidushi Purnima Sen. And I was also lucky to have learned for a short while from Pandit Vidyadhar Vyas. And uh, I think all of them have been great inspirations. They're all, 
you know uh, in hindustani music you know you say um that uh, it takes a lifetime to learn a rag and it does actually to truly learn a rag but i think the reason why i wanted to learn classical music was because it somehow reverberated with my soul you know it was something that was so all encompassing i just had to learn it and maybe that is also one of the reasons why i found a lot of peace in life because in the sunny music is very meditative and it allows you to connect with nature with everything around you and you realize how insignificant you really are you know uh you're muted yes dear thank you ma'am thank you so much for sharing all of that we'd love to hear you sing as well would you oblige to sing a song for us sure sure why not but what do you what will i sing that is the thing your most favorite one which is close to your heart now tell me you see in hindustani music we have uh, music for different times of day so uh okay let me just sing a little a little something that will give you an idea you see the the essence the typical or something typical to the agra gharana is the nomto mala so uh, the nomto mala basically is you know there are no words you use syllables of the phrase om ananta nara and narayana hari you use syllables of that and you create a soundscape so i'm singing you want you really want me to sing now yes please and i just please. i just put on my tanpura yes and i'll sing a little ala okay ना re na re 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 na these are more questions no yes dear. that was nice that was very humble of you and very polite of you to share that beautiful song with us that's really nice thank you so much ma'am now ma'am we go on to the next question what does freedom mean to you being a woman being a human being on this earth what do you think freedom is for all of us yeah that's a lovely question i wish i could explain it you know freedom is having the liberty to make your own choices i think a lot of as as you say a lot of women are deprived of that and uh, perhaps one of the uh, one of the reasons why i think i am blessed is because i've always had that freedom you know to make my own choices very important in life to be you know 
uh, allowed to say what you actually feel and not to uh, a lot of, I know a lot of women who kind of try and, uh, you know, to keep the balance, they will say what is wanted of them, which is not actually what they feel. But I've never had to do that. So I have always been very privileged, I think, because in our country, one of the biggest problems is freedom. You know, freedom of choice, freedom, all kinds of freedom. I mean, I think women um, are deprived of it. And uh, sometimes I react very badly when I see other people, um, you know, not being given freedom. That's probably when I, you know, when my activist mode kind of gets uh, turned Activ on, so to speak. Huh? Activated. But, yeah, absolutely, yes. So, but uh, yes, I think freedom is something which you have to be very blessed to have, you know, especially when you're a woman. But I think one, one thing I must say, over the years, it has changed. You know, 30 years ago, women had a lot less freedom. Today, women are given a lot more freedom. Uh, but you see, the other side to it is that it also implies responsibility. You know, just because you have the freedom, you can't really do anything and everything. You, you have to be responsible towards uh, society, I guess. You know, because after all, you are representing women. So, you know, just because you you have the freedom to make choices doesn't necessarily mean that you will make choices which um, might be, you know, unfortunately, I'm saying this because around me, I find a lot of young people making a lot of very silly choices out of defiance rather than anything else. And that is very unfortunate, you know. Um, to be defiant is not something that works in the long run. You know, that is something uh, you have to learn to curb if you feel defiant. I, I will actually give you an example. I learned it the hard way actually. Because I, uh, I remember we went, I was uh, president of Miranda House and we, one women's day, we had, a, you know, a morcha, you know, we, we'd gone because there was a lot of, uh, at that time, there was a lot of ragging and there was a lot of, you know, women were being harassed a lot, Eve teasing. So we went on a protest march and I was very defiant in those days. And I realized that uh, maybe that was not the best way to do it because of the reaction of the uh, university officials, you know. So later on we went and we negotiated, which got us a better deal, so to speak. So, um, yes, I think over the years I have done things which I've kind of momentarily regretted, but I've learned from them, you know, and improved. Yes, dear. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for sharing that. Dear ma'am, how would you want people to remember Arpita Chatterjee as a musician, as a teacher, music therapist, as a counselor, etc.? As one oh, that I want the world to remember you. That almost implies I'm dead. I'm not. Oh, one fine day. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. You get it in the wrong no, way. No, no, but you know, I, I understand what you're saying. I just put it more that... simple. Ma'am, just give me a moment. <laughs> I put it in a very simple way. One fine day, we have to leave this earth, say goodbye Absolutely. to this earth and merge with the soil. Absolutely. Now, when we are no more, how mm -hmm. would you want the world to remember you? 
as somebody who um, perhaps, um, I don't know, I haven't thought about it. I wish you told me, I would have thought about what I would want people to remember me as. I think uh, just somebody who never gave up trying. You know, I think I think that is uh, the essence of what I have done all my life. I never gave up trying. And I was always looking for different ways to find happiness. And um, I just call myself a traveler. Uh, you know, somebody who is now still seeking and who still hasn't found the answers. Because, you know, life always, you've probably found an answer to one thing, but then a question comes along. You know, as you go along, I think you understand what I'm saying. Because life is always full of ups and downs, right? So you find answers to certain questions, but then a new set of questions evolve. So you need to find answers again to those questions. So it's a continuous process of changing and evolving and, um, you know, finding stability in a very, how will I say it, a world which is unfortunately not at peace. You know, I, uh, I wish it would be at peace because life is so much easier when things are peaceful. But the world isn't at peace now. The world is very chaotic. And uh, there are still people who are, uh, uh, you know, who are trying to uh, show their power. And it, it, this, is, this is something that I would uh, kind of object to because, you know, the power struggle is never something that is worthwhile. And I would say that I, I would like to be remembered as a seeker, as somebody who's always tried to find stability and peace and happiness. That's great. That's great. That's wonderful. Now, ma'am, we come down to movies. Which is your favorite movie? All-time favorite? Pothir Pansali. You know, we have seen it, I think... About twenty-seven times, you know. So my subject is Pansali. Yes, yes. I I saw it um, many, many, many. I don't know how many times I've seen it, but it's an amazing film. And um, the other one I would say is Garm Hava, that I actually had the privilege of uh, knowing the director. He'd come to Delhi and I, I was then in college and he was kind enough to give us a showing of Garam Hava so that we raised funds in Miranda House. And uh, yeah, I think those are the two movies that are, to my mind, absolute greats. So, you know, he, he inspired me a lot. I did work actually on production you know, for film production as well, for a while. But uh, never really found the scripts that, you know, I, I was looking for. So I got out of it fast. But um, I, yeah, I would love to work in a film like that or in a film like Pothir Pansyali. I mean, such a learning experience these films were. Yes, dear. And... Uh, the movie which you just mentioned, Garam Hawa, was, uh, you know, released I think in nineteen seventy four. More than probably, 40, yeah, 50, probably about fifty years, five decades ago. Yeah. Yeah. that's wonderful, ma'am. That's really nice, uh, taking us back down to memory lane with all those beautiful movies, which really had good content, a good message for the society, than the mindless violence that we see nowadays. Unfortunately, in the movies. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, ma'am, what is it that you love about Arpita? What are you proud Ooh. about Arpita? What do you admire in Arpita? I don't. Just one sec. Sure, sure. What do I admire? I don't, actually. I think uh, too many uh, faults 
you know, nothing to admire really. But yes, one thing I, I know, I, I, I'm a very resilient person, you know, and a very determined person. So if I set my mind to do something, I generally kind of do it. Now, that is something that uh, I have. Uh, yeah, I think that's the only thing, being patient and being de determined. Those are the two aspects of myself that I can say I'm happy about. The other stuff, I'm very short-tempered. I'm very untidy. I, um, you know, I'm very finicky and very, very much of a perfectionist, very difficult to get along with. You know how it is. So, and the one person I admire for tolerating me all these years is my husband, because he's the exact opposite of me. As you can make out, I love talking. And my husband is a very quiet soul. And, you know, just the fact that he's tolerated me all these years. So uh, I don't, that there's not very much of me that needs to be admired. You know? Your resilience power, your determination, and the never give up attitude that makes you. I think it. that, yeah. I think those, those, those I'm happy about, if you know what I mean. Yes, that's really nice, ma'am. Thank you for sharing. Now, ma'am, we'd like to know your thoughts on how the world should evolve in the next 50 years. There's a lot of change being happening over these past few decades. Now, what is the real change that we look forward to? You know, um, it's, it's funny that you say this, look forward to... Um, well, for one thing, I would look forward to peace, but it's not happening right now. Um, one thing that hasn't actually changed is human beings. You know, they're still the same. You might have lots of technology and you might have a lot of AI and you have a lot of gadget, gadgets that you can use. But, uh, you know, all the failings of human behavior are there. So um, how in 50 years, how I see the world, uh, well, I'm, I'm hoping that we will have leaders who will um, take us to peace, you know, a world which is not one of uh, people trying to play power struggles. And, you know, that isn't a very nice world. I would look forward to a world where all women have freedom. And by that, I really mean all women across all uh, social, social and community, uh, you know, everything. Where women's rights don't have to be fought for. You know, one of the reasons why uh, a lot of people say that you know, the minute you say women's rights, it means that they're not there, isn't it? So, I mean, if you have to fight for something, it's it's only because it doesn't exist. That's why you're fighting for it. But uh, I would love to see a world where you don't need to fight for all this, where everybody has the same status, irrespective of gender. In fact, now irrespective, you know, the LGBT community also getting their rights and uh, a world which is happier. I would love to see a world which is much happier and much more at peace. Wonderful. That's a beautiful uh, way to look forward to that beautiful transformation where we concentrate on peace and happiness. That's all we want towards the end. Our last breath should be connected with peace and happiness and our, the people uh, who love us should be surrounded, you know, in our vicinity. And then that should be a beautiful time. So, no, ma'am. Now, let's not go there further. You know, I start becoming so much like into that. I just go off in the flow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I, I've already reached now that 50 years, like when there's going to be peace and when there's going to be happiness. So I've just gone to that moment. Ma'am, would you like to be?
please share your favorite quotation or a proverb with us, dear. Favorite? It could uh, be. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I, I saw a, a lovely, you know, uh, WhatsApp is a wonderful uh, communication tool. And some of the things that get shared on WhatsApp are really amazing. And uh, just, just today, a friend of mine from school shared something. And now that you, you know, tell me, um, I'd like to read it. A thought, a prayer. In the silence, I sometimes feel a silent pain and a dropping tear. It feels so close. It feels so near. I catch my breath. I look in the sky and watch the clouds go floating by. I stop what I'm doing. I say a prayer and silently it goes, no, not where. You know, it, it's been going on in my head ever since I read it. So I thought I'd share it with you. Wonderful, ma'am. That's really very nice, very interesting. And it has a deep meaning as well. That's wonderful. Now, ma'am, you are a nature lover as well. Are you also a person who loves pets? Oh, yes. Yes, we used to have a lot of animals in the house when my children were smaller. Uh, my husband is a great carer. We used to have a huge aquarium. In fact, three aquariums. And we used to have birds. And uh, in those days in Kolkata, there was the Birla Industrial Museum where you could become a member of the pet club. So my children uh, used to bring, you know, like guinea pigs and rabbits. And for three, for nine months, you could keep a pet. So we had um, in our house, every time the, the <laughs> pet would arrive, it would somehow reproduce. So we had one rabbit and we gave back th uh, four rabbits. Then we got one guinea pig and we gave back three. So you could exchange pets actually, you know. So um, the reason why I made my children members of the pet club was because, you know, um, they wanted pets. And frankly, the problem with having a pet is that unless you can take the pet with you, your movement gets very restricted. So, you know, I didn't want that to happen because I was working, my husband was working. If we kept a pet at home, it would be alone all day. And if we wanted to go on a holiday, unless the family we were visiting or the uh, hotel we were visiting allowed pets, we would have to leave the pet at home. I didn't want that. So the pet club was a very good answer to that. But I'm not so sure that there are too many pet clubs functioning nowadays. So uh, maybe a request to animal lovers is at least for children to start a few pet clubs. Maybe I would start one too. But, you know, I think I'm too old for it. Somebody younger would be able to look after dogs and cats better. Yeah. You could initiate this process like then people will join and they'll take over. You just have to just be like, a, you know, uh, on a the mother top. figure. Yeah, yeah, a mother figure. Just I know like what you, that, mean. you know, Spread yeah. your wings and then you will have many people who will be interested in that. Yeah, maybe. That's a good idea. It's a very good initiative. Mm -hmm. Now, ma'am. Before we, we move on to the smaller section called as the rapid fire round, one other major question, ma'am. If given a chance to relive somebody's life just for a few moments or maybe for a few hours, whose life you'd love to relive? Whose life? You mean which person? Yes. Oh, I think Robindranath Tagore. Wow. Fascinating life. You know, just imagine somebody in one lifetime creates that much of uh, poetry and music and theater and writing, then makes a university 
starts an entire movement. Amazing person. Ooh, I would love to meet a go. <laughs> That's really nice. Very interesting, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. That really tells me that you have a great love for Rabindranath Tagore, his writings, and all the work that he's been connected oh, with. Oh, yes, of course. Grew up with in that culture. My mother, my aunt uh, grew up in Shantiniketan. So, you know, different word. I, excuse me, I'll just drink yeah, some sure. water. Yes, dear. Ma'am, we'd love to know now about Food. You're from West Bengal. Mm. And West Bengal is famous for all kinds of dishes. It could be veg and non-veg as well and lots of sweets as well. We'd love to know, are you a good cook? And if yes, I think I'm a good cook. I, think, no, I, I believe <laughs> I am a good cook. I am a good cook, is it? You know, I can't say I am a good cook because it's, it's dangerous. If you say that and, you know, Suddenly, one day you haven't cooked well, then you've had it. Very so I, I love cooking, actually. It is one way of, it is my way of, um, I don't know, when I get, you know, very worked up about something, I, I cook because it's very de-stressing. And it's, you can do a lot of experimental work, you know. You put in some spice you haven't used before or, or you cook it in a way that you haven't done before. Comes out tasting different. I really enjoy cooking. I love eating also. But anyway. <laughs> that's really nice. And you say cooking is therapeutic. Like you could innovate. Absolutely. That's really yes, nice. yes. Yes, yes. Absolutely. It works therapeutically for me. But yes. Um, it can also get stressful. You know. Uh, I mean, if you are expected to cook for a huge family and, you know, that can be stressful. But for me, it has always been very therapeutic. That's really nice. To know. Now, ma'am, you are in West Bengal. Which is the famous sweet that you love? There are different kinds of sweets in West Bengal. So which is your favorite one? My favorite sweet? I have a confession to make. Yes, please. You know, I'm I'm not very much of a sweet person. I actually like savouries much more. But yes, um, the mishti doi, you know, and uh, rajpog, roshomundi. I don't know if these are things that you've uh, tasted, but. Uh, Lots and lots of sweets. I wouldn't be able to finish. You know, this party shapta and uh, Gokul Pite. Lots, lots of, I mean, uh, it's difficult. Too many choices. You yeah. know? Yes, dear. Thank you for sharing all those names. I've heard few of them for the first time in my life. The different <laughs> names that you've shared. And, you know, I really feel my mouth-watering now, like wanting to have some of them. Yes, dear. And my dear friends, if you'd love to have lots of sweets, you could visit West Bengal. It's really famous for all different kinds of tasty sweets. Now, ma'am, uh, we come to an end to the main session and now we enter into the second segment. It's called as the rapid fire round. It will just take another five minutes, ma'am, to get to know about your likes and dislikes. Okay. Yes, dear. My dear friends, join us on this round called as the Rapid Fire Round to get to know about the likes and dislikes of our celebrity and guest. She is Mrs. Arpita Chatterjee, joining us all the way from Kolkata, West Bengal, India. Ma'am, your favorite color? Blue. I mean, there are various... Aquamarine tape. blue. Aquamarine blue. Your best friend's name? Anjana Basu. Your dream project for the future? Oh my goodness. Ah, that's difficult. You could skip that. That one I haven't as yet thought of. Yes, dear. Your favorite sport? Swimming. Wow, that's great. Do you love gardening? Uh, I won't say love. My husband loves gardening, but I have an interest in it. That's great. Now, ma'am, are you a tea or a coffee person? Tea. 
very much of a tea person. Though, if I, if you ask me what coffee I'll drink, it'll always be latte. Yes. Now, ma'am, how would you define a day? A day that has been very you know complete and peaceful and calm? Or how should a day be for you or the 24 hours? Uh, how would you explain or describe a day just in one word? Ek sundar sadhan, ek hi shabd mein kaise aap explain kar paayenge? In one word, I suppose peaceful. Well, I guess that. Because initially I asked you a question, mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, uh, you just focused on peace and happiness. Yes. Dear. Yeah, I would, I would, uh, you know, a peaceful day is... Yes, a day should be peaceful or you would would love a, a day to Absolutely. be defined very peace, uh, in a very peaceful way. That's Absolutely. Nice. So in the end, that's very true. In the end, you know, it's all that matters to all of us is peace. That's why they say rest in peace. You have done a lot now on, on earth. Now when it's time to leave, you just rest in peace. So I think peace is very costly nowadays for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. So yes. Yes, dear. What makes you smile, ma'am? What makes me smile? I don't know. I think I smile too much. Maybe I shouldn't. Hmm? What do you say? You should smile, ma'am. That is infectious <laughs> and it is, you know, really good to see people smiling than to have frowns on people's faces like him. True, true. What yes. makes me smile? I suppose uh, a baby. If I see a baby, I would smile. If I see a bouncing puppy, I would smile. If I see a beautiful flower, I would smile. If I see, uh, you know, a lovely cloud, you know, white clouds floating in the sky, I would smile. Oh, it doesn't take much for me to smile. I love smiling. <laughs> That's nice. Even you've mentioned about the clouds. Watching mm -hmm. the clouds pass across, you know, just like that. Yes, yes, exactly. Feeling. Yes, and brings yeah. a smile on my face. I could resonate with you on that now. Now, dear, are you scared of anything? And if yes, what is it that scares you? Scared? Mm. Scared of unrest, I think. I'm scared of uh, instability and lack of lack of peace. You know, and I, <coughs> I would say, if there's anything I'm scared of, it is unrest. Yes, dear. Thank you for sharing, ma'am. On a scale of one to ten, how much would you rate yourself with regard to forgiving other people in your life? Forgiving other people, actually, I'd, I've, I've forgiven everyone, you know. I'd probably put it at nine. Nine. Great. That's wonderful. Now, ma'am, if, if you ever get a chance to meet the almighty or the universal energy right, in whichever you believe, what is it that you would ask from the almighty or the, or the universal energy? What kind of a superpower would you want? I wouldn't. I wouldn't want a superpower. No, I would just ask that there be peace, you know? Or I would ask, why isn't there peace? Wonderful, that's true. Yes, dear. Now, ma'am, are you a beach person or a forest person? Where do you find more peace? Oh, I, I'm both, actually. I love forests and I love the sea as well. It's difficult to make a choice. But of course, the way the world is going, you know, the kind of deforestation that is happening. I mean, I don't know. I wish there were more people who were planting trees and, you know, working towards making a greener earth because we really need that. It's the need of the earth. I actually work with an organization called Center for Ecological Movement. And we try to do things which are, um, you know, good for nature. 
So one of our major areas is planting trees, but uh, you know, forests are, I mean, I've actually, you know, every holiday we got, we used to go off to forests. Have you ever come across a snake or something like that? A, a snake? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Lots of times. Lots of snakes. And in fact, there was a snake farm in Badu that uh, I used to regular. I used to run a children's organization at one point. And we used to go, you know, on excursions with the children. And um, there used to be a gentleman running a snake farm on the outskirts of Kolkata. And I used to visit it regularly. Uh, unfortunately, the snake farm has been shut because uh, they couldn't find anybody who would look after the farm. But um, yes, snakes, of course. Amazing creatures. You can learn so much from them. And scary too, huh? I'm scared of them. Yeah, scary. But, um, you know, if you... Uh, the thing about the animal world is that they never attack you. I mean, unlike human beings who attack each other, animals never, never really attack ex except when they are hungry. So, you know, um, it's a wrong concept that the animal will attack you. It won't, unless you harm the animal, then it's only trying to defend itself. You know, animals actually don't attack unless they're hungry. Yes, dear. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for sharing your time. Thank you for sharing all the wonderful experiences that you've had. There's still a lot of treasure hidden in you, which I would request you to share in part two as well. If you would oblige your time once more for us on the International Fab Talks, that would be a blessing. Oh, I'd love that. It was great talking to you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, ma'am. I should thank you first because you've taken out the time for us and shared all your experiences. The way you talk, the way you carry yourself is very graceful. That's really nice. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. We look forward to many more interactions with you in the near future as well. And we wish you all the best. And we'd like to see many other youngsters, you know, rise up just like you, to shine just like you, in spite of the odds. They have to pick up all these beautiful aspects from you, which you have shared, focusing on peace, on resilience and all of that. Uh, before we end, one last request. We'd like you to share three magical words with us. Apart from please, sorry, and thank you, you could share any three words as a gift to the International Fab Talks. Oh, my goodness. Hmm. Now you've, you've got me, really. Only three words. There are so many I can think of. You can add to the list. How about uh, How about happiness and joy? and uh, resilience and uh, maybe um, humor. Well, yes. Happiness, joy, resilience, humor, etc. Yes, you'd like to add more? Yeah, mm -hmm. if you give me a little more time. All the merrier. You add more, yeah. we really feel great. <laughs> As I said, if you give me a little more time, I, I could go on. You know, there's so much to be said, actually. Uh, but then at the end of the day, as the three essential words will be, would be, you know, peace, happiness, and satisfaction or contentment. Hmm? Yes, dear. Peace, happiness happiness and contentment right that's one yeah. thank you very much ma'am thank you very much we look forward to the next interaction with you very soon thank you so much thank you Absolutely. thank you dear my dear friends uh, with this we'd like to sign off from the international fab talks for today do us a favor share this video with the right kind of people people who may be interested in Right. Ma'am has shared all beautiful incidents with regard to her life. As a little child, till date, she's always been very active and she continues to do that till date. We'd love you to learn all these beautiful things from our celebrity and guest. And of course, if you like what the International Fab Talks is doing, do us a favor. Like, comment, subscribe and share to the International Fab Talks. And don't forget to love yourself and love the universe. Stay blessed.
Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.